There are few deliveries in the world as difficult as transporting wind turbine blades. It's a task requiring such skill and precision that there is only a small bracket of vehicle drivers in the world that are qualified to undertake such an operation. But the transport on its own forms just one piece of a complex logistical puzzle that is the installation of an onshore wind farm. Even more so when a developer decides to install a wind farm in, let's say, the Cantabrian Mountains of Spain, the Daliangshang Mountains of China, or the Askio Mountain Range in Greece all projects which currently exist. If you've ever visited the mountains, your trip will likely have gone something like this. After a long drive in which the last 10% in distance took almost 50% of the journey in time, you start your day's ascent up the mountain. The rain that was forecast for this evening begins within 10 minutes of setting off, a soggy and slippery walk in shoes, and just as you think your heart is going to give up in protest at your body for putting it through this arduous endeavour, you finally top out at the summit. And of course, the view from the top makes the struggle 100% worth it. Except, of course, if the poor weather is still there and you are actually just standing in the middle of a cloud barely able to see your own hands. Much is true for the wind power industry, except that wind turbines don't like views. They like, well, wind. Which, again, if you've stood at the top of a mountain, is plentiful at those altitudes. Given turbines have a power output that scales with the cube of the wind speed, mountains seem then, at first glance at least, an attractive resource for harnessing wind energy. So let's say you, the developer, wants to implement a new wind power project in the European Alps. Before any proposals are submitted or any initial designs are even worked up, you need to know where you want to install your wind farm. A choice, of course, constrained by a multitude of social, environmental, legal and topographical considerations, but ultimately boiling down to one thing. The wind. In order to assess a wind farm's production potential, it's crucial a developer knows what kind of wind patterns the site will experience in the long term. In most cases, computer models will provide a pretty representative insight to this, but in complex terrain such as the mountains, extrapolated models like this will begin to break down. Obtaining representative data for sites in the mountains requires, often for every group of three to five turbines, a physical meteorological station taking measurements at the precise height of the turbine for one, if not multiple, years. It may seem a tireless process, but the data collected is invaluable to a wind farm's future success. So you are now erring on the optimistic side already one or two years down the line. But if you are thinking of beginning work on the site anytime soon, you'd be very wrong. Once a location has been decided, a long planning and permitting phase ensues. This is a process that can typically take anywhere between two and eight years, depending of course on the specific details on the project, the country it's in, the number of appeals and delays, and a whole list of other things I will spare you the time of listening to. Up until now, a decision to construct turbines in the mountains has appeared, if anything, a small compromise to pay for potentially massive gains. It's in the final few years of the project's timeline, the transport and construction phase, that these fruitful hills turn from a logistical challenge into a logistical nightmare. The process of transporting a turbine to the mountains often begins a year before transporting the turbine, in an excruciatingly complicated planning phase. Picture for a second transporting this along this, and it soon becomes clear why. It's no surprise that many of the largest wind turbine factories are situated in large port cities and towns and not inland. Whilst these will mostly focus on offshore projects, the fact still remains. Wind turbine companies will avoid road-based transport at all costs. But unless you are planning on sailing a barge up this alpine stream, it's clear that to get into the mountains, we have to move our turbines on the back of one of these. The route from the place the turbines are loaded up to the site may well cross multiple country borders. And carrying an 80 metre long turbine blade on a public motorway without any prior modification is probably not the best idea. Most turbine components will require obtaining an abnormal load permit, 
generally issued by local and government authorities, and a process taking anywhere from two weeks to over half a year. Some routes may also require temporary traffic removal orders, and depending on the countries the convoy will be travelling through, there will likely be a large variation in laws, costs and processing speeds to deal with. In advance of the transportation, test drives and extensive route analysis must also be performed. For sharp bends, of which mountain roads have plenty, a swept path analysis must be conducted. This essentially means making sure the transport is physically possible. If this is not the case, it could require the removal of trees, lampposts and walls, or obtaining permits to widen the road or use private land for turning. Throughout the lengthy building process, life has to be able to carry on as normal. This means taking into account and minimising the impact on school bus routes, entrances to factories and warehouses, and the operation of farms in the area. And to work this out on paper is one thing, but putting it into practice is a whole other challenge in itself. Of the different classifications in the heavy haul and special loads trucking industries, wind turbine blade and tower drivers find themselves in the very top division. They are, if you like, the top gun of the trucking industry. Drivers currently working on the Three Gorges Yin Yang Wind Power Project in China endure what is a two week long journey through the Dalianshang Mountains before they finally breathe a sigh of relief when they reach the site at 3,500 metres above sea level. And whilst the drivers deserve most of the credit, the machinery they operate is an engineering marvel in its own right. Recently, innovations such as this patented blade lifter technology have rapidly simplified blade transport, allowing the blades to be hydraulically pitched and rotated while minimising the size of the trailer required. In this system, the blades can also be rotated along their long axis, which is quite useful when you are carrying what is effectively an 80 metre long wing. And though the blades are perhaps the most striking example of this challenging transport process, the 100 ton plus nacelles pose issues of equal magnitude. Hauling these parts up gradients sometimes in excess of 30 degrees requires trucks with special gear ratios, engine brake retarders and extra fast transmissions, or sometimes even additional vehicles to tow them up particularly steep sections. This is a crawler crane and it's what's needed to lift the nacelle onto the turbine. Depending on the height of the turbine and the weight of the nacelle, these cranes can reach widths of nearly 30 metres, which, to put it into context, is wider than many two-lane roads. And given a turbine is only as good as the crawler crane used to assemble it, they too need to be carefully transported to site. With a challenge of execution though, there is also a challenge of time. The weather in the mountains is, by nature, unpredictable. Summer comes late, winter arrives early, and in between, well, the weather does what it wants. There are few things that will delay a project as much as a long bout of rain and fog, and snow can cause operation to cease entirely. Excess water running off the mountainsides can damage access roads to and between the turbines, and cranes cannot operate if the wind speeds top out above a certain level. It's a stop-start process that requires an immense level of patience and urgency at the same time. And once winter arrives, well, you can go home and come back next year. The issue of the weather is not one constrained to the transport and construction phase of a wind farm. Wind farms need to be maintained, and that means driving machinery, conditions dependent, to the site. This of course also means that, during winter, repairs requiring a crane cannot be carried out and regular service is done using snowmobiles and snowcats. For this reason, plant reliability is vital. Often developers will favour proven older technologies over newer, more efficient technologies, such as the severity of a long-term halt in production. If you've ever travelled by plane during a period of cold weather, you'll likely have witnessed a process known as de-icing. The build-up of ice on a plane's wings and engine can severely alter its ability to fly safely, and hence it's crucial that ice is removed prior to operation. The same is true for a wind turbine. A build-up of ice on a wind turbine's blades alters its shape and adds additional weight, which could cause damaging vibrations if it were to continue to operate. To prevent outages, solutions such as internal blade warmers are implemented, 
and though they reduce the turbine efficiency, they at least prevent the ceasing of production altogether. And then comes the task of bringing the power to the consumer, which, given the lack of transmission lines in these areas, would require yet more construction. It's easy to see then that for most large-scale applications at least, wind farms in the mountains don't really make sense. The small gain in output simply doesn't justify the logistical and economic headache that goes into realising such projects. But that's not to say such projects won't continue to be implemented, albeit perhaps on a smaller scale. As towns and cities in mountainous regions inevitably join the energy transition, wind energy can be an attractive resource, particularly as hydropower output reduces in winter months. But viable or not, one still cannot help but marvel at the intricate planning, technology and human skill that goes into making one of these projects a reality. I'm Luke, and this was The Upshift.